All right, so stopping off briefly at a, well, uh, I wouldn't know it as a Rakuten Panzer. What did you call it? It was a tank destroyer in Austria. It was the tank destroyer Jaguar. We so you call, you call the Jagdpanzer then? Yeah. Okay. We purchased it from German surplus. They used the ATGM, the HOT, HOT mm -hmm. 3, with a six round or six missile ready to launch drum. So that they figured out the, they were allowed to have missiles again? Uh, we, in, the, in 1989, we declared that part of the state treaty as obsolete because the idea in 1955 was that Austria is not allowed to have any ballistic intercontinental missiles like V2 or, or something. We interpreted this until 1989 that we were not allowed to have any missiles and then this was cancelled with the agreement of all the signing states like the Americans, the French, the British and the Russians and we purchased the anti-tank guided missile, the BIL, mm -hmm. which is the, the infantry anti-tank yep. yeah, the infantry anti-tank weapon up to 2,000 meters and the Jaguar with a hot system for up to 4,000 meters. Quite a capable vehicle with six rounds in a ready-to-launch drum. So when the missile is on, on the way, it flies for 14 seconds, has a double-shaped charge, warhead, and it's wire-guided. Mm. But when the missile does not respond more than 0.2 of a second to the, to the uh, guiding system, the system says missile is not on the way. So the wire is blown away, the empty tube is thrown away, the ramp goes in, mm -hmm. grabs the next missile, out again, and aligns to the line of sight of the gunner. So the ramp automatically loads, it's not, yeah. the, it's not the guy yeah, inside no, putting no, it no. in? Complete, fully automatic, uh, automatic reload. So within how, how long does that take? 40, 40 to 45 seconds with target acquisition, guiding time, reloading time. You have 45 seconds with a 95% hit. And did these replace the cuirassiers or did no, they? No, it, it were, they were in addition to the cuirassiers. So we had a mix for up to 1500 meters. It was a cuirassier task and even to uh, be used as a recce vehicle. And up over 2000, 1500 to 2000 meters, it was uh, the, the job of the Jaguars. So the standard reconnaissance unit would have cuirassiers as well Curious as smaller years, vehicles? Yeah. Curious, they, they, there was in the recce, Battalion, there was a mix of wheeled vehicles, light reckeys on the Pinskauer and armored recce with uh, 20 millimeter APCs and cuirassiers. I wonder how heavy those are. Uh, 25 kilos without the packing. That's not bad. It's not so bad, no. Tank rounds are. Tank, tank round is 40 kilo? No, less. You haven't had one. I'm thinking pounds. It's been a while. It's been a while. I'm also trying to convert to kilo, so the, you divide the, by two. The normal, the normal the Leopard 2 round is so eight, 15 to 18 kilos. Okay. It's a little bit heavier. I'm just going to edit that bit out, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I lied. There are two iconic Austrian vehicles. The Curacier is one of them. The other is the M47, because Arnie was an M47 tanker. Did, did yes. he, does he have a good reputation? Was he a good tanker? What's, he what's was the a very good driver. Because I talked to his tank commander, he's now a retired warrant officer, and Arnie was a very interested and, and capable driver. So he spent three years in, in the army in a tank battalion in southern Austria, and he was driver on an M47. Therefore, the Austrian army decided give him one vehicle, one M47 that was put back in running order and handed over to Arnie as a gift. Where it now is in the US. <laughs> did it, they didn't put, fix the gun, did they? I don't know. I don't know. I, I know that <laughs> it was completely running and he got some he publicly, spares. He publicly does not know. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't want to know. Well, it's legal in America. So have a quick look. What, what's, do, do you really need a sign to say this is a tank? This, is, this was the tactical sign for the armor school. 
Okay. This vehicle is a prototype. It's a normal M47, but as the M47 had some troubles with the engine, not that the engine was not powerful enough, but the petrol consumption was horrible. Okay. It made out of 1100 liters best petrol, made up only 110, 120 kilometers on, on roads and 60 to 70 kilometers cross country. Yeah, oh, the M48 was as bad, yeah. Uh, nearly the same, but therefore in, in Austria, we could not afford this. In, in the late 1960s, a petrol crisis and horrible uh, prices on, on, on petrol. Therefore, we decided to bring in the AVDS 1790 engine, the air-cooled diesel engine mm -hmm. from the M60 into the M47. So we got the solid back then? Yeah. We have oh, this redesigned yeah. the back. We also changed the turret hydraulics to the hydraulic system of an M60. The idea was to have any, a, a little bit more commonality between M60s yeah. and M47s. This vehicle was trialed then until 1974. And at that time it became clear that the gun, the 90 millimeter gun is not capable enough. So we had the chance in 75 to order a second batch of M60s in the US. Oh, so for a while you had M60 and M47 yeah. serving side by yeah. side. Different yeah. units, I presume. Yeah, different units. We had two M47 and two M60 battalions. Okay. And then this project died. The vehicle was handed over or stayed at the armor school. So the idea was it can be used as a training aid, but you need, in, we're in Austria in fact, and you needed two different driving licenses because from the hull, it was an M47. Engine wise, it was an M60. So nobody at the Amos School, except of one or two, had the proper driving, driving licenses for this type. Okay, for gunnery training, it could be useful. No, it was a 90 millimeter gun. Turret had hydraulics from an M60, so the M47 guys could not use it because different turret drive. The M60 guys said, different gun, what do you use it? So it stayed at the Amos School and then it was used uh, at the army technical department because all the M47s in Austria, the turrets were removed and placed into fixed positions as anti-tank guns. And this was used by the technical department for trials and evaluations. Were they powered in those fortifications? They had or was it just hand cranked? Oh, they, had, okay. they, they, had, they, had, they, they were hand cranked yeah. turrets, but they had their own power plant in the, in the installation. Hmm. Well, uh, so you said that you had, you decided of all the different countries to go with American for the main tanks. Yeah. Why the M47 and not Centurion? <laughs> Good question. Personally, I think because the M47 was so cheap. When you look into the old papers, the United States Army offered the M47 for one symbolic dollar per tank. That's a good reason. And I think... <laughs> We made that deal. Yeah, because the, I mean, the Americans didn't want it. It was just a temporary uh, stopgap. Yeah. So. Okay, that makes But uh, in hindsight, did the Austrians like it? Yes and no. It was quite popular because it was the first modern tank in Austria, mm -hmm. in Austria's inventory. But on the other side, when you look into that turret with, a, with a, the rangefinder, the rangefinder is, uh, how it's called? What, the stereoscope? Therefore, you need specially trained people and you need people or gunners who can see in a, in a, in a distance. Yeah. So that was not very popular. It was very in training intense. And on the other hand, the turret looks from outside quite roomy and big but it's very cramped inside. Mm. So gunner and commander don't have enough space and it's horrible for the loader because all the ammunition is not in the turret, it's under the turret's floor. Big radio in the back and no ammunition. 
So it was not that popular. When the M60 came up in Austria in 1962, a complete new world opened. 62. 62. Oh, that's, okay, you were one of the early purchasers. We were, we were the first country to get the M60A1. So it was, yeah, it was the spearhead of, of, of the Western world. It was the high-end tank at that time because there was no Leopard 1, there was no AMX-30. The M60A1 was the high-end vehicle. And Austria got a 112 vehicle in, in 1962. Let's go that way. <laughs> okay, so since we're talking M60s, let's move to it, and it's, uh, it's like an M60 A1 AOS passive, I mean, you, you guys upgraded them a little. Yeah, we first got M60 A1s in a very, very early stage, and we did not modify them until 1985, when we ran out of spares for the turret because all the mechanical calculator, the, the coincidence rangefinder, we didn't have any spares again mm -hmm. and therefore we had to do something. In 1982 we bought 52 vehicles from the last production in the US, M60 A3s, and therefore it was clear that we modify our remaining M60 A1s to that configuration. So you had A3s as well as A1s? We had A3s, but only A3 passive, Okay. With, only with a, with a passive night vision. And we modified all our vehicles then to that standard. And you even got the M85 machine gun, did it? Ah, fantastic. It was a very, very good gun. When you we need we okay we need to get him talking to some American tankers <laughs> because yep. that in America that has an awful reputation, atrocious. Uh, in Austria, it was like everything else on the tank. It was a training matter. If you train your crew on that gun, and we trained them very very hard. Okay. So it was, we had some issues. Being honest. Some commanders, they did the so-called commander's round, doing not the proper loading drill, mm. and they only got one shot. Mm. If you do it right, there was no problem with that gun. It was a fantastic gun. Yeah, I have, in fairness, found a couple of Americans that said exactly what you said. Most, okay, 95% <laughs> of American tankers don't like the M80. So when you got the M60A1, what was the coaxial machine gun you got with it? Was it, it was the M79? The, yeah. And then the M M219, the upgraded version. Okay. And we changed that in the 1970s to the Austrian MG74, which is in fact a modified MG42, a German one. Well, I saw one on top of the uh, the PC back there. All right. Okay. So we have we completely upgraded. We now have a stabilizer, stabilization, laser range finder, laser range little finder, hole there, ballistic computer, night vision equipment and an Austrian-designed thermal shroud. The thermal shroud? What was wrong with the American one? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the amount of money went into to designing a shroud for the 105. I don't know. That was the Austrian, the Austrian solution. And we got a fire suppression system in the turret, which was uh, taken over from one of our prototypes, mm -hmm. where, we, where we trialed this. and. That worked quite well because I had two times the honor to get to set my turret on a little bit of fire. So I'm looking at the front slope and I see the the X grousers for yeah. ice. I'm looking at the track and I don't see any way to unbolt for the X grousers because Absol it's the chevron. Absolutely true. This tank was his whole life in the logistics school. Okay. That means this tank has roughly 120 miles since 1964. <laughs> Therefore, this is his first track. That was the track this tank was delivered with yeah, in 1964. Standard American track. Standard yeah. American. We upgraded in the, first we upgraded to the T142. That's the one with the six... The, the hexagonal pads, hexagonal yeah. pattern. 
and then we modify it to a German track, like the, the same track as Leopard 2. Okay. So they... The, grou the grousers are, were part of the modification, and they only fit into the German track. They do not fit on this one because this is his first track. So watch, somebody's going to make a model of this particular tank. They're going to put it onto a model club display <laughs> for a competition and he's going to get marked down because, oh, you've got the wrong grousers for the wrong track. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to work. But it's a real thing. It's true. <laughs> it happens. So you did some time in the M60s. I joined the army in 1988 and I was trained as a gunner and as a tank commander. Mm -hmm. I was then platoon leader and squadron commander. And so you, then, you, I, then I converted with a squadron to Leopard 2. But you're, did you look fondly upon the M60? Yes. You did. It, it was, being honest, this was the first great love of my life. <laughs> it was the, the tank that impressed me very, very much. Do Austrians name their tanks? Uh, do, you put, do you put names on your tanks? Like person's names or just slogans? Sometimes, or yes. So what was your tank called? Uh, I don't, mine, mine didn't have a name, so I, I had, we had only symbols on it. Okay. So my, my squadron had a bright green rhino. Okay. The other squadron in the battalion had a black bison. And number one had a, a, a yellow buffalo. And sometimes, depends on the battalion commander, brigade commander, these squadron symbols were forbidden. So we, they had to be camouflaged. Then we had uh, the rhino in camouflage green. And when the battalion commander changed, we had it in an even brighter green. <laughs> okay, so Austria is relatively unique. There's not many countries that can say they've run both the M60 series and the Leopard series to do a direct comparison, but uh, France here is one of those people that can tell you this is less comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. M60 is like a living room. It's huge inside. You can store all your belongings inside. You have, of course, you have your large pack outside. But everything else, you can cook inside. It's fantastic. You have your, your stove and you cook your meal inside. Fantastic. You can sleep in the turret. You can, all, the turret crew, all three, can sleep in the turret. Fantastic. When we converted to Leopard, it was a completely different thing. It's cramped, it's okay, it's much better protected. It's, for us, it was like a starship. Yeah. Uh, to drive full speed cross country and hit the target 1,500 meters away or 2,000 meters away. Impossible with the M60, because M60 is, you had to know your vehicle speed and vibration and take the right spot to fire. Yeah. Completely different to Leopard. But Leopard was at that time in the 1990s a much better tank, of course. Oh, yeah. But it was not comfortable as M60. <laughs> and I remember quite well when we changed over, it was a real nightmare where to put all your stuff. I mean, even the outside, we've got a huge bustle rack on the M60. You don't have as big a uh, rack you, on the, yeah, the left rack. You, you can store everything and you can put on all some bins for your, for your food and for drinks and, and everything. And the M60 has so much room when there's no ammunition in, you can store almost everything. So when we, when we went in 1991 for active service on the southern border of Austria when Yugoslavia collapsed, the M60s were fully loaded with ammunition. Mm -hmm. And we found out that with a fire suppression system we built in, we can't, cannot use three ready ammo racks. Mm. So we had three rounds too much. We put it on the turret, <laughs> put it outside, strapped it down, <laughs> worked perfect. When you first load your vehicle, okay, in training we did it part, partly uh, fully load with ammunition, but when you do it with all the life rounds, from hand grenades to signal flares, everything, you don't have any space left for your equipment. 
Well, that's, I presume it doesn't get any better on this one either. It's so. even worse. Yeah. So we were sitting inside there going, how, how do you live when you have your NBC suit or your sea, whatever you call it these days, Seaburn? And it's kind of like, well, the, frankly, you can't even get your NBC suit on no. when you're sitting in this thing. It's, it's almost impossible. In M60s, you can change your clothes quite comfortable to NBC equipment. In Leopard, it's really hard, especially on the, on the commanders and gunners position. It's where, almost impossible. Where do you sleep? Do you sleep on the back there, on the engine? Uh, or? In the M60, yeah. <laughs> the complete turret crew slept inside. So the gunner on the floor, mm -hmm. the commander slightly over the gun. Okay. In, in a hammock or something? In a hammock. Okay. So it, then it was place left for the gunner. We removed the gunner's seat and it's it done. was possible. Okay. In Leopard, you can only sleep at the back, outside. Right. So you, you didn't sleep under the tank or on the side? No, or, you know. no, 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 no. Too dangerous. <laughs> you know, it's about, oh, snow. Yeah, it or, or it sinks in or whatever. You don't want to risk. Because yeah. it was on concrete. There's a famous picture of an Austrian crew eating I, as it's pissing I rain know. outside. That was uh, in, in Gravenburg in Germany uh, during the Strong European Tank Challenge. Ah. And they watched live firing from the other platoons. Does Grafenvor have the same reputation in Austria as it does in the US? No, because we never been to that Canadian Army Trophy oh, or whatever. Okay. We're not part of NATO, so we're neutral. We're now joining the Strong European Tank Challenge. And in 2017, I think, you won. we won. We're the oldest Leopard 2. <laughs> So is there any, I mean, the A4 is now getting a little bit old. Yes. Uh, with, uh, you know, very few countries don't have the, the new armor and maybe the L55 gun. What, what's the Austrian plan? <sighs> Hard to say. So right now in Austria, there are thoughts about uh, any upgrade or conversion to whatever. We don't, we, there is no decision right now. But being honest, the A4 version is makes the most of the of the leopard fleet right now so from finland to turkey a4s are everywhere and they use it quite a lot so it is still a capable tank it's armor protection is a little bit poor firepower is quite good but being honest austria has to do something with the a4s let's see what the, what the near future brings. All right, so that's the end of the tank section, but it's actually not the end. The camera's over there. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's actually not the end. There's a little bit of artillery here, including one or two unique pieces I, haven't, I completely even forgot existed. So at the end of the Panzerhall, uh, so I'm guessing the Priest is another vehicle that you inherited from the, uh, from the Americans after the war? Not, not really. The priests in Austrian service came, of course, from US Army, but they were all sold in the 1950s to the French Army, and we bought it from the French. What's the, uh, what's the history behind the, the white, and white triangle? I mean, obviously white and red are the Austrian countries, but why a triangle? In between World War I and World War II, there was the need for an aircraft marking. Mm -hmm. And the, everything else, red, white, red, like a dot, was still in service. That was Turkey at that time. So Austria had a little bit of a competition in the army for a new symbol. And the outcome was that triangle on the red spot. At that time, it was the logo of a brewery. <laughs> Definitely. It was the logo of a brewery. Austrian brewery. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, Czech that's brewery. <laughs> which, which was uh, just right before it was Austrian. Okay. Uh, so did they object or? No. no, no. It was common sense that this will be the new marking for the Austrian at that time aircrafts. 
Okay, so two other vehicles that kind of caught my attention. One is an early M109 with the small gun. Uh, it's kind of, I don't remember ever seeing a live one. <laughs> I don't know how many exist even still. Probably not many. Ah, they are quite rare now. Austria, like on the M60, we were the first customer on the M60s, or M60A1s, and with the M109, we were one of the very early customers. So in 1972, Austria obtained the M109 in the what is now called the basic configuration with a short 155 millimeter gun. And these were for the three mechanized brigades? That was for the three mechanized brigade, artillery battalions, and all the guns were converted then to longer barrels. They're, some of them are still in service mm -hmm. because we are still uh, equipped with M109s. Now in the A5 Austrian versions, very similar to the Swiss version, but all the basic short barrels were replaced either by long ones or were converted to command posts or fire control centers. So this is the only fully working remaining M109 basic in Austria. And I think it's, there Probably are not the only many. working 109 basic anywhere at all. And <laughs> you look inside, it's absolutely pristine. Yeah, uh, roughly 3000 man hours on restoration. Out of, out of curiosity, does the Austrian army feel any particular affinity to either the German or Swiss army as kind of close friends, close relationships? Right now, yes. In the past, until, the, until 1991, we had very close relations to Switzerland and to Sweden. Mm -hmm. And now we have to... The neutral club. Ne neutral club, yeah. <laughs> Ex-neutral club. <laughs> and now we have very close links to the Germans, to the Swiss army. We, we do some development work, like the M109A5 was developed and also manufactured between Switzerland and Austria. And you're still officially neutral. The, the yes. treaty, of tra treaty of States hasn't changed. The... No, 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 no. And the neutrality is very, very popular in Austria. No, no. Well, it was in Finland until about two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in Austria it is still popular. And I think there will be no majority for any NATO assignment or whatever. We're quite happy as we are. How, how involved are you in uh, United Nations peacekeeping roles? Very, very involved. So we, we had a permanent battalion in Cyprus. We had a permanent battalion on the Golan Heights in Israel, or between Israel and Syria. Mm -hmm. We're, we have a battalion in Kosovo. We have a battalion size formation in Bosnia. So we're right now in Do Mali. you have any army left here? Yes. <laughs> now, we, we are a small army, but we have 25,000 regulars and 25,000 conscripts a year, and another 50,000 reserves. But we have roughly 12 to 1,500 soldiers permanently serving United Nations or European Union duties. Right, so I saw the cursor here had the K4 marking. Yeah. So any other armored vehicles to go along? Uh, mainly Pandurs. Pandurs and the light protected, the, the Dingo and the uh, LMVs, mm -hmm. the Iveco LMVs. So going back quickly to the conscripts, so a, uh, not everybody does military service. They just kind of pick and choose a few? Or yeah. just every, okay. We have two two parts. We have one civil service for emergency service or, or any hospital care or whatever. And we have the military service. And you can choose. Six months or eight months. Six months military training, eight months civilian civil training. Defense. Okay. And so once they go in, you do your eight months, you get out. How, how often do you get called back in? It depends on. If you go into the reserves, then you have an annual training every year, every second year, for 10 days. Surely, I mean, that's hard to operate a tank. I mean, are the conscripts going to put the conscripts in the tanks? In the past, we put the conscripts almost everywhere. So from infantry to armed fighting vehicles. 
I personally had a lot of crews made on the concerts, and they were fantastic. They were trained as drivers, scouts, loaders, and really good results. Now it's a little bit different because now you have to volunteer to become a reserve. Therefore, normally the guys, especially on, on tank and infantry fighting vehicles, they serve longer than, than, than the conscription. Mm -hmm. So then they come back in the reserve. So Switzerland has, of course, the shooting culture that. The, everybody in the military has a gun, they like shooting, it's a national sport almost. It's, yeah. it's apparently not the national sport, but you almost think it is. Is there a similar culture in Austria? No. We, we have the army shooting club, the army sports club, so it is quite popular within the reserve community. But it's not that popular as in Switzerland. There's no shooting culture in Austria. <laughs> All right. Okay, so one other vehicle that he did mention, and I'm a little bit surprised you don't have many, is the Pandur. Which yeah. is the, you know, I guess if you think about any modern Austrian vehicle, the, the, the Pandur is probably the one you're going to come up with. Definitely. So, built by GDLS, who also I think now make the Moag Piranha. Yeah. <laughs> so, why, what does the Pandur do that the Piranha of the time does not, or did not? Your neighbors in Switzerland. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Pandur is, or was in the original configuration, it's a 6x6. Six six. So, it's smaller. It fits much better for the Austrian needs on narrow roads. Can turn better around corners and so on. So it is surprisingly it performs really good on monuments in Kosovo and Bosnia. The problem as an infantry vehicle is there is not enough room. Therefore, we have now a new type, the Pandua Evo. Evo is the evolution which has a little bit more room, better protected, mind protection, and so on. But our vehicle was the trial vehicle for the United States Special Forces. So this served in the US trials and it came from GPLS to the tank hall because when the trials were finished, it was just sitting in the factory and now it's on display in the tank hall. Oh, I was wondering what the red flashing light was in the process of ambulance vehicles, I guess. <laughs> it served in the trials, it served many different roles. Oh, okay. It was a command post, it was an infantry carrier, it was an ambulance. And it is still an ambulance. It's fully equipped with everything a modern type ambulance must have. So how often does the public get to see these things driving around? Do you have open days or anything? Driving happen? around is once a year. We have once a year. It's, it's the Austrian type of tank fest. Mm -hmm. It is more or less an event where we bring out all our running vehicles. It's between 20 to 25 armored vehicles and a lot of guest vehicles. So in total we had 150 vehicles around. And is that, that truly is in Indiana? It was in Vienna. It was in Vienna, right behind, behind, behind the museum is a park, and it was held in the park. Okay. Yeah. In the center of Vienna, fantastic event. So we bring out our armor vehicle collection, collectors from all of Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, and the Czech Republic come with their vehicles. So fantastic win. Perfect. Reenactment from Allies World War II up to Cold War, everything really great. When, when is this happening? First weekend of June. First week. Same as the Canadians. <laughs> Sorry, I'm already, I'm already booked for the Canadians. Sorry, but it's not this year, it will not happen. Because of the COVID situation, when we had to decide to do the event. Oh, then we were still in the lockdown phase. We were, we were in the lockdown phase, so we could not make a, a serious decision. Okay. Therefore, we said, no, we won't do it in this year, but in 23, it will happen again. Okay, guys in Ontario, move your thing, one <laughs> week, one side or the other. Please. <laughs> All right, um, I think pretty much the end. Uh, I, I suspect that's just a souvenir that you think of. 2S1 
one was an exchange program. The Polish Army Museum wanted to have an M1 mine. So they got one from Austrian circles. And we got instead the tourist one. Which is now quite good because the, the collection here not only serves as a museum display, it serves also as an instruction collection, uh, teaching collection for the army. So the army will send their personnel here? Yeah. So I have, every week I have army personnel here for seeing their own history as tankers or army infantry or Yankees. But also we have a running T-72, the BMP-2, the 2S-1, the T-55, and in the past, every time when we sent out soldiers to, let's say, Chad or Mali, mm -hmm. then we gave them an introduction to what can you expect there? What, armor, what type of armored vehicles are there around? And that was quite helpful. It helps get the funding in, I guess. It helps on one hand also the, and to understand, to, to see and to understand means also to get in touch with it. Mm. So if you have been in a T72, then you know what are the capabilities. You yeah. can imagine what are the capabilities. And that's one of the main benefits of this collection for the army and for the visitors that there are all the things that are still yeah, I, 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 In fairness, I see you have project entries that people can stand up and look yeah. inside. Very important. Uh, I, I think it is as well as a lot of museums don't do it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important because that was, that's what I expected from a museum. I always wanted to have a look inside. Mm -hmm. I cannot give access to all the vehicles, but some vehicles we have stairs and you can look in and I change it from time to time. And sometimes the left is open, sometimes uh, one of the curacies or the tourist one or the BMP. Just have a floating around. Wait, well, I think I've run out of things to talk about on this trip, uh, but I strongly suspect I will be back in Austria to, to do a little bit of film here. Uh, Franz, thank you very much for the talk. I hope you all found it interesting and informative, and we'll talk to you on the next one. Take care.